sanctuary. All right, now let's pray, and I want to dive into God's word for today. Uh, So let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts as we uh, look into his word. God, thank you for this time uh, to be together today. Thank you for the opportunity to look at your word. Lord, your word is uh, powerful. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts to the deepest part of who we are. And I pray you would speak to us through your word today, that your Holy Spirit would illumine our minds and help us to understand what your word says. And we would respond to your word with faith, with obedience, that we might change how we live because of what you tell us today through your word. So we, we ask that you would meet us in this place and teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Well, just this week, as I was unloading the dishwasher, I uh, I was putting the glasses on the counter. You know how you just sort of organizing and you're putting things away. Well, I, I, my hand slipped and I knocked one of the glasses onto our tile floor. And tile floor is not forgiving. And the glass shattered and there was glass all over the floor. And has this ever happened to you? Okay, so, so of course there's, you know how it is. You've got these big pieces that you're trying to pick up like, oh, careful. But there's little pieces Little shards that are almost invisible. So you've got to get the you gotta get your broom out and you gotta sweep it all up and then you still can't see. So you get the vacuum out and then you know, like days later you're like, what is this on my finger? Like it's just glass everywhere. It's shattered. It's everywhere. And it's a mess. It's a mess to clean up. Uh, and maybe today you feel like that glass. You feel shattered. That game last night. What? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> but you know what? There's more than that, right? You maybe you, don't, you couldn't care less about the Packers, and that's fine. Uh, there's so many more serious issues, things going on in people's lives. Like maybe you are in a family that's divided. Uh, maybe you're facing financial instability. Maybe you have job insecurity. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction, or maybe you have a loved one who's struggling with an addiction. Or you're struggling with infertility, and it shatters you. Or maybe you are a parent, and you are feeling like a failure as a parent. Maybe you have major health concerns right now. Or you're facing incredible loneliness Or maybe you have a critic who is ruthless toward you at work, at school, or in your own family. Or or you look at the world today and all the things that are going on and your heart breaks. You feel shattered. Or maybe you're grieving a loss. There's so many reasons why we might come in this morning and feel shattered. Just a little bit or a lot. All of us in one way or another may feel like that broken glass. We feel are a mess. The perfect time to pray is when we're broken. You know that? It's a good time to pray. These are situations that really drive us to our knees. And we see this in the life of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. So if you have a Bible with you, let's look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's page 234 in the hardback CSB. If you grabbed one of these Bibles off the cart as you came in, it's to page 234. If you have a Bible app on your phone, just go to that. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're also going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 more in depth. But 1 Samuel 1 is sort of a flyover. Uh, so let me just tell you what's happening in 1 Samuel 1. Uh, there's a man named Elkanah who had two wives. We see that in verse 2. That was his first mistake. You think he's going to keep both wives happy? I think that's a good idea. I think that's God's design for marriage. No. He has two wives. One of his wives, Peninnah, had children. The other, Hannah, was childless. She was barren. Elkanah showed favoritism toward Hannah, not Peninnah. I wonder how that went over between these two wives. I don't have to wonder. It was brutal. Verse 6 tells us that Peninnah taunted Hannah severely just to provoke her. And this went on. Not for days or months. This went on for years. So here you have Hannah who's unable to have children. And you have Peninnah who is a rival wife who has children and is fruitful. And Peninnah is taunting Hannah. And year after year, Hannah doesn't have a child. And it is painful. Hannah is shattered. She's shattered. So Hannah 
goes to the temple and she pours out her heart to the Lord, vowing that if she could bear a son, she would give that son to the Lord's service for his whole life. And the Lord blessed Hannah and she conceived and gave birth to a son and she named him, what? Samuel. After he was weaned, she brought Samuel to the temple to fulfill her vow to the Lord. So essentially she gave Samuel quite literally back to the Lord. He wouldn't live with Hannah anymore from maybe age three for the rest of his life. He would be devoted to the Lord's work all the days of his life. And so now, fast forward now to chapter two. So that's the flyover of chapter one. Let's look at chapter two of 1 Samuel. God responded to Hannah's cry for help. And now we see in chapter two, Hannah prays a prayer. It's a prayer of hope. So when God responds to our prayers for help, We can pray this prayer of hope. We'll see it. Let's break it down. Three parts to this prayer. Here's the first part. Number one, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Why? Why should we rejoice in the Lord? There's three reasons that we see in verses one through three. First, we rejoice in the Lord because he saves. He saves. Look at verse one. Hannah prayed, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My hope is lifted up by the Lord. So that line, my hope is lifted up by the Lord, is literally my horn is exalted in the Lord. If you're reading the ESV, that's how it's translated. It's more literal rendering of this phrase. My horn is exalted in the Lord. And we see similar language in the Psalms. Psalm 75 verse 10, all the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horn of the righteous shall be lifted up. Psalm 89, verse 17, by your favor, our horn is exalted. Now, what is going on? <laughs> what horn? <laughs> what is it? Are we talking about a bugle? Boop, no, we're not. This is an animal metaphor. The strength and glory of an animal is its horns. An animal lifts up its horns when it is victorious. So when Psalm 74, 10 says the wicked's horns shall be cut off, it means their strength, their glory is cut off. Now this animal metaphor is interesting and it continues in the second part of verse 1. Look at, ver- look, look at verse 1 again. Hannah continues her prayer. My mouth boasts over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Now the first line of that is literally, my mouth is open wide against my enemies. I believe that animal metaphor is continuing here. So so picture an animal's mouth open wide to devour its prey. Wow, That, that might seem a little bit severe for Hannah's situation. But you know what? Hannah is not expressing personal vengeance. The Lord has given her victory over her enemy, which we could probably say is her rival wife, Penina. Uh, but there is something deeper going on here. Hannah is identifying with the nation of Israel who has dealt with many enemies, and we're going to see that more clearly in the next part of the prayer. So the beginning part, we rejoice in the Lord. We are victorious because... He saves. That's number one. Number two, he is holy. He is holy. We just sang that. He is holy. Look at verse two. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. So Hannah is echoing the song of Israel after they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Do you remember this story? And Egypt pursued them in their chariots, and the soldiers and the chariots were swallowed up by the sea, and the Lord saved them from their Egyptian enemies. And what did the people sing? It's in Exodus chapter 15. Look at this. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Now, these rhetorical questions have an obvious answer, and the answer is, No one, there is no one like the Lord among the gods. There's no God like the one true God Almighty. You see, the gods of Egypt, it's really clear in Exodus, the gods of Egypt were lifeless, they were useless, they were impotent against the Lord God Almighty. Now look at the second part of verse 2, and there is no rock like our God. God is our firm footing, our rock. 
There is no other foundation. I love what commentator John Woodhouse says. This God cannot be set alongside other options that might be the focus of our hopes, our confidence, and our dreams. Nowhere will you find goodness as perfect as the holiness of the Lord. Nowhere will you find safety as sure as our God provides. The gods of this age in 2022, the idols of our day are also lifeless, useless, and impotent compared to the one true God. Yet, we, today, we get tricked like the Egyptians. We think somehow that our gods, our idols, will be able to give us what we need. In fact, they might even be able to save us. Well, what, what gods, what idols? Well, I'm glad you asked. I got five modern-day idols. Here's number one, the God of self. The God of self. I got this. I can save myself. Thank you very much. So how many songs, movies, books, and magazines tell us that we have everything we need in ourselves? Oh. Just recently, we uh, watched uh, the Nutcracker and the Four Realms movie. It's based on the ballet. I mean, Disney put it together just to make some money, right? Uh, Nutcracker and the Four Realms. Let me just summarize it for you so you don't have to waste 90 minutes of your life, all right? <laughs> Clara, the main character, discovered a box that her mother left to her before she died. Spoiler alert, her mother died. Her mother's message was simple to her daughter. In this box, you will find everything you need but she can't open the box so she has to travel to the four realms to get the key and then the key's stolen and then she has to chase it down and she finally gets the key she finally opens the box and what does she find inside a mirror what does that mean she didn't understand at first and then she realized oh my mother was right everything i need is me it's Disney's favorite message. You are all you need. It's a lie. It's a lie. Don't buy that lie. We're not all we need. We're not enough. We cannot save ourselves. We are not gods. So don't buy that lie. Second God. You ready? Money. Money. Money can take care of all my problems. If I just had more, I would be okay. Money will provide for me all that I need and all I could ever want. I just need to do more, work harder, so I can have money. Money will take care of me. Money will supply for me. But that's a lie. Look at those who have more money than they can spend. Are they happy? <laughs> no, they are some of the most miserable people in the world. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, either, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Number three, here's the third God. Intellect. Knowledge will save us. Science and technology. Uh, not since the Industrial Revolution uh, I'm sorry, not, this isn't new, right? This is, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, we believe that we could save ourselves with ingenuity. If we think we can save ourselves through intellect and knowledge or ingenuity, we are fooling ourselves. God number four, political leaders, political leaders. It's easy to make political leaders in, uh, into gods or saviors. If we could have this person in office, or if we could, then we could be saved, or if we could get this person out of office, we will be saved. Political leaders, I want to tell you, they're not gods. They're fallen human beings. Number five, comfort. Comfort. Comfort will provide what I need. If I could just be comforted, if I could just have leisure, if I could just rest, right? So I have a confession to make uh, since I was young. You know this already. Since I was young, uh, I've been a diehard Packers fan, and I died hard yesterday, <laughs> right? So 
I, last night, was up till 12.15 in the morning, struggling to sleep, and I was disappointed, like most of you Packers fans. But I was mostly disappointed in me. Why do I allow a game to bother me so much? It's been a lifelong struggle for me. And I I know, deep down, the Packers are an idol in my life. And underneath really that, it's not the Packers, it's really comfort. I feel comfort when the Packers do well. I feel comfort when they succeed. I feel good inside. I feel happy. And when they lose or when they disappoint like they did last night, then that idol is ripped away from me. And I have to drive myself back to the Lord because he is the only true source of comfort and peace. But comfort can be an idol in many forms in our lives, right? Maybe it's not sports. Maybe you couldn't care less about sports. Maybe it's uh, a relationship or maybe it's any of these other things we talked about. Money can be a source of comfort as well. So we have to rid ourselves of these idols and recognize that these idols are not going to save us. They do not give us what we need. There's only one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sustainer of the universe, the all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, infinitely holy God. So we rejoice in the Lord because he saves. He is holy. And number three, he knows everything. He knows everything. Look at verse three. Do not boast so proudly or let arrogance, arrogant words come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and actions are weighed by him. Boasting and arrogant words reveal something that's happening in our hearts, something deep inside of us. It reveals we think we know everything, talking as if we know the future. It's arrogance. And in the New Testament, James warns against this kind of attitude. James chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. We need to be careful about pride in our hearts. We don't know it all. We do not know the future. We don't know what will happen even tomorrow. Commentator, one commentator I read this week says, human pride is a form of pretending. That's interesting. Pretending what? Pretending we know the future or that we can control it. That's both ridiculous and tragic. We don't know, but God knows. He is a God of knowledge. And actions are weighed by him. So God not only knows everything, he sees everything. And all of our actions are weighed by him. He knows all. He sees all. So we should rejoice in the Lord because he saves. Because he is holy. And because he knows everything. Let's put our hope in him. That's the first part of Hannah's prayer. Rejoice in the Lord. Second, the Lord's reversals. The Lord's reversals. The Lord... Does amazing reversals, shocking reversals. We see it all the time. Let me show you some examples. First, the Lord reverses the strong and the weak. Look at verse 4. The bows of the warriors are broken, but the feeble are clothed with strength. The Lord weakens warriors and strengthens the feeble. The Lord, uh, those who seem strong are weak before God, and those who are weak are, uh, and needy give strength by God, are given strength by God. So we see this actually later in 1 Samuel in this book. We see a feeble boy with a few stones and a sling bring down a giant. The Lord did this. He clothed young David with strength. Second, the Lord reverses the fortunes of the full and empty. Verse 5. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are starving hunger no more. So a great reversal occurs. The full are those who once had wealth and now have to hire themselves out just to eat. Those who are starving are suddenly blessed. 
The Lord does this. He is sovereign. Now we see a different kind of fullness and emptiness. That's the next part of verse 5. The woman who is childless gives birth to seven, but the woman with many sons pines away. Hannah has been barren. She's empty until she gave birth to Samuel. The reversal was true for Hannah. She had five more children after Samuel. Did you know that? She had five more children. But Hannah recognized having many children does not make a woman fulfilled. The Lord fulfills her. He is enough. Third, the Lord reverses life and death. Verse 6. The Lord brings death and gives life. He sends some down to Sheol and raises others up. The Lord is sovereign over life and death. He ordains every day and every breath. He can bring people back from death's door. And for reasons we cannot understand, the Lord sometimes chooses to have some pass away. The Lord is sovereign. He's sovereign over all of it. Fourth, the Lord reverses the fortunes of the rich and poor. Look at verse 7. The Lord brings poverty and gives wealth. He humbles and he exalts. So God has given financial blessings to some and not to others. Why? We don't know. He is sovereign. He, is, he has eternal purposes. The Lord sometimes reverses the fortunes of the rich and poor. We've seen it. One moment a person has lots of wealth and then they lose it all. Or one has nothing and is materially blessed all of a sudden. It's not mere chance. The Lord is sovereign over it. It is the Lord who brings up the poor. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the trash heap. He seats them with noblemen and gives them a throne of honor. The Lord helps the poor. He provides for them. He raises them up. He did this for Hannah. Hannah was poor in spirit. She was unable to have a child. And she poured out her heart to the Lord and he heard her prayer. He used Hannah's son, Samuel, in amazing ways. Sam, Samuel was seated with noblemen and given great honor in Israel. So how can God do all this? Look at the next part of verse 8. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. He has set uh, the, wor- the world on them. Again, we were reminded here that the Lord is the creator of the earth. He made all things with the word of his mouth. God is sovereign over all, therefore God can do amazing reversals. So the third part of this prayer of hope is, number three, God's blessing and cursing, verses 9 and 10. Look at verse 9. He guards the steps of the faithful ones, his faithful ones, but the wicked perish in darkness, for a person does not prevail by his own strength. If you are genuinely seeking the Lord... Maybe asking God for wisdom for a decision. The Lord will help you. He desires to help you. He's not a God who stands up in heaven and says, Ha ha, I have a secret will. And I know this person is praying and seeking me, but they're just going to have to figure it out on their own. Ha ha ha. God's not like that, right? He is a loving father. God is a loving father who does not take delight in tricking his children. We need to know that. When, he said, when it says that uh, here in this verse that he guards the steps of his faithful ones, he will guard and guide his people, those who are faithful to him. The Lord guards the faithful. But you know what? The flip side, he's very much against the wicked. That's clear. In verse 9, look at it again. The wicked perish in darkness. A person does not prevail by his own strength. We are not enough. We talked about that. We are insufficient to figure out this life on our own. We need the Lord. John Woodhouse says this, The winners in the end will not be the strong, the powerful, the wealthy, the famous, the popular, the successful. So who are the winners in the end? The winners in the end will be the faithful. Those who seek the Lord with all their hearts. So are we doing that? We all want to be fruitful, but that's not really our job, nor is it our, in our control. We are called to be faithful. God will make us fruitful. 
Don't miss that. We are called to be faithful. God will make us fruitful. God's opposition to the wicked continues in verse 10. Look at it, verse 10. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. Wow, that's strong. But it's a warning for us. If you are opposing the Lord today, you need to yield. You need to surrender to him. You'll be shattered if you don't. On March 30th of 2021, a driver on an Ohio interstate missed her exit and thought she could turn around in the express lane for some reason. She turned into an oncoming semi-truck, and let's look at the picture of it. Bad idea, right? Miraculously, you won't believe this, she survived. She turned right into an oncoming semi. Her car did not survive. Her car was shattered to pieces. So I I bring that image up to just show us, if we oppose the Lord, we will be shattered too. It's like trying to do what that woman, woman did, drive right into oncoming traffic. God is not to be trifled with. God is the creator of the universe. And anyone who opposes the Lord, that will never end well. Don't oppose the Lord. We may not be shattered right away. We might think we're getting away with it. It may take years. Or it may be until the day we stand before him on the day of judgment. But God will judge. We see that really clear. He will thunder in the heavens against those who oppose him. James 4, 6 is clear. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So, God asked this question. In what ways are you opposing God today? Is it in a relationship? A particular relationship? Are you opposing God by ignoring the Holy Spirit's clear voice? You know, God's calling you to do something and you're not willing. You're opposing him. Are you mistreating people in your life for selfish gain? Are you cheating or stealing or lying or lusting? The list goes on. We we oppose God when we disobey his word. And we live in that in an unrepentant way. We're bullheaded and we want to go our own way. Yield. Turn to God. He is loving and kind and he wants to forgive you. But if you won't turn to him, you will be shattered. Look at the middle of verse 10. The Lord, look at this. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Make no mistake. God will judge the ends of the earth. There is no remote corner of the earth that God will that that will not have to answer to God. Now the last part of this prayer, end of verse 10. He will give power to his king. He will lift up the horn of his anointed. Interesting. Wait wait a minute. (laughs) What does that say? Beginning that, that line, he will give power to his, what? His king? Wait a minute. There is no king in Israel, as Hannah prayed. There's no king. Th- this is coming off the period of the judges, which, by the way, we will see. There's no king in Israel. Hannah does not know about the kings to come, which we'll see in the books of Samuel. King Saul King David, King Solomon, Hannah knows nothing of this. So in this way, Hannah's actually become a prophetess. Dill Ralph Davis points out, Hannah was crushed with grief and moved to prayer. For Hannah, this grievous personal distress, uh, this was grievous personal distress, yet in it, Yahweh drove her to prayer, through which he brought forth a lad who would shield his whole people. God moves our prayers and magnifies their effectiveness. So we need to pray. Notice how she refers to this king at the end of verse 10. His anointed. You see that? The Hebrew word for anointed is Messiah. Translated into Greek, Christos. Christ. Hannah is ultimately pointing to the Messiah, to Christ. Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Little does she know, but she's doing it. And also notice, what do we see come back 
that we saw in verse 1. The horn, that's not Satan. No, sorry. <laughs> Horns, right? The horn, right? The horn comes back in verse 10. He will lift up the horn of his anointed. So what's happening here? Hannah's prayer begins with her victory, and it ends with the victory of God's anointed, the Christ, the Messiah. Dill Ralph Davis makes this point. He says, the saving, this, uh, he says, the saving help Yahweh gave Hannah is a foretaste, a scale model demonstration of how Yahweh will do it when he does it in grand style. I love that. It's true. Samuel, Hannah's boy, Samuel was a miracle child that points to an even greater miracle child. Samuel was a help to his people that points to an even greater help to all people. Many years later, another woman prayed a prayer similar to Hannah's. It has many parallels to Hannah's prayer, and she prayed this. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, Because the mighty one has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. Who who prayed this? Mary, the mother of the Christ, the Messiah. The ultimate hope for our lives is found in Jesus. Is he your hope? Is Jesus your savior? If he's not, you can turn to him right now. He can be your savior today. He can be your hope. He can be the one who fulfills you more than anything else and meets your deepest desires. That's what Jesus wants for you. So I'd urge you, turn to Jesus or turn back to Jesus Now, there is no one like him.